were at Lystra on the first missionary journey, Acts 14, we said that Paul was addressing an audience which had never been influenced by Hebrew theology, an audience which knew nothing of the Old Testament. And so that affected what he said. Now for the second time in the book of Acts, now we're on the second missionary journey, Acts chapter 17, Paul is also encountering an audience who know nothing of the God of the Bible. They know nothing of Old Testament theology. They know nothing of monotheism. They know nothing of an ethical deity, a righteous deity. They know nothing of sin and atonement and salvation. They believe in many little gods small gods, gods which are nothing more than men who have, and women who have certain extraordinary powers and enhanced capacities. And so it's, it's very instructive to see how Paul will handle an audience like that. And the first thing I want you to notice is this. Look at verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, that is, he stood on top of the hill, and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. Now think about that. We're told in verse 16 that when he saw all their idols, it really upset him. It, it brought him into a kind of emotional turmoil. He reacted to the false worship. Yes, they were religious, but their religion was false. But he doesn't tear into them and condemn what they believe. He begins at the most positive point, and he pays them a compliment. He says something positive. Well, I see that you're very religious. And he not only pays them a compliment, but he finds a, a place, a, a kind of common ground with them. Because there was an idol in Athens, which was dedicated to the unknown God. You know, um, the, the Athenians wanted to cover their bases. They wanted to make sure that they didn't overlook any God. They were afraid of, of offending the gods. They wanted the favor of the God. And so, um, just in case there was a God that they didn't know about, just in case there was an idol that, um, that they didn't build, just in case there was a God that they didn't make an idol for, they created a, an altar to the unknown God, a God that they'd not discovered yet, a God that they didn't know about. So they built an altar and they wrote on it the words in Greek, agnostotheo, agnostotheo to the unknown God. And Paul saw that. And he realized that they were admitting that there might be a God that they don't know about, a God that they hadn't heard about, a God who was yet undiscovered by them. And he says, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you have admitted that there may be a God that you don't know about. And I'm telling you that there is a God you don't know about. And I'm, I've come to tell you about that God so that you will know about Him. And he says in verse 24, okay, now, w w you need to understand this. Um, do we have a marker back here? Yeah. There are two words that we normally use. There are more than two words, but there are two main words that we use for the deity in the Bible. And one is the simple word God. Okay? Um, this is what we might call the generic word for God. And uh, In Hebrew, it looks like this. 
That's the word Elohim. God, the generic word for God. Then there's a word which is normally translated Lord. This is not the generic word for God. This is the personal word for God, Yahweh. Yahweh is the personal covenant-making God of Israel. God, Elohim is God the Creator. Yahweh is God the Father. Elohim is God the Creator. Yahweh is God the Redeemer the God who saves, the God who enters into a personal relationship with us and who brings us into his family. Now, if Paul is preaching to a, Judea, to a Jewish audience, they know about Yahweh. They know about sin. They know about holiness. They know that there's only one God. They know that you can have a relationship with God. They know that God has given us a law. They know that God has sent prophets. They know that God has promised a Messiah. But the Greeks do not know this God. They do not know Yahweh. They've only heard of Elohim, and the Elohim they know about, the God they know about is not Elohim. It's not the God of the Bible. They only know about little bitty gods who have little bitty capacities and who do little bitty things. They only know about a God who works in little corners, little areas, little, little oblasts, little districts. And so Paul has to tell them about a God that they don't know anything about. He tells them about a God who made everything. That's a new thought for them. He understands that they don't realize what God is. Um, in 1990, I came to Moscow and met with a young man whose father had been a diplomat in Canada. He lived in Canada for seven years. He spoke perfect English. And supposedly, he had become a Christian or he had prayed to receive Christ when a team of athletes had come in about a year before. He was a baseball enthusiast. Hardly anybody in Russia knows anything about baseball. This young man knew everything about American baseball. He knew a lot more about it than I do. And he'd been attracted to these athletes and he had prayed to receive Christ with them. But while, while I was meeting with him, I was doing what we call initial follow-up somebody has become a Christian, so now you're talking them about their Christianity, helping them to begin to grow in their faith. I said something about prayer, and he stopped me and he said, can you tell me again what prayer is? And then later in the conversation, he said, can you tell me what God is? Not who God is, but what God is. And I began to realize how successful the Soviets were in eliminating what we might call theistic categories, words about God, from the Russian vocabulary so that people did not know what you were talking about. It wasn't even a question of whether you believe it or not but you couldn't even understand the concepts. I had a similar experience with a young woman working in the Forum Hotel in Prague in 1988. She spoke perfect English. This is during the Soviet period when Czechoslovakia was communist. She spoke perfect English. But when I tried to speak to her about God, she did not know what God was. She did not have that concept in her thought world. 
Well, the Athenians, when they thought of God, they didn't think of one God who made everything. That, thought, that was not in their thought world. They could not conceive of that. Paul understands that. So he begins to speak to them about the God who made the world and all things in it. Now, the Greeks were very prideful. And they actually, the Athenians actually, actually believe that God made, that the gods made them especially, and that the gods made them different from everybody else. We're going to see something about that in a minute. And they were also very proud of their temples, their beautiful temples, like the Parthenon. And what Paul tells them is, I got news for you, God doesn't live here. God doesn't live in your temples. They're beautiful buildings to be sure but they're not the house of God. God doesn't live in your temples. God made everything. God made everything in the world. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with hands. Why would, God, why would the God who made your hands and who made everything live in something that your hands made? He is not served by human hands. He doesn't need anything. Now, verse 25 says, He gives to all life and breath. In other words, He not only made us, but He sustains us. He keeps us going. Now, this is very simple to you. You have a Christian background. You've been exposed to the Bible. You know about theism and you know about theology. They know nothing about this. They don't know that one God made them. They don't know that one God sustains them. And you may have classmates or you may have neighbors in the places where you live who also don't know that. And you need to work hard to speak their language, to get down on a level where they are and don't assume that they know the things that you know. Not only do they not believe the things that you believe, they don't even know about the things that you believe. So you have to tell them about those things. That's what Paul, the master apologist, the master missionary theologian, that's what he's doing in Athens, and we can learn from him. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Now, the Athenians believed that they were a special creation, that they weren't like everybody else. But look what Paul says. Verse 26, God made from one every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So we all came from one ancestor. His name was Adam. And we should seek this God. We should try to find this God. And, you know, in verse 27, he uses, you know, the most famous Greek myth was the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Iliad is the story of the ten years of fighting at Troy. The Odyssey is the story of how one man who fought at Troy took 10 years to get back home. That man's name was Odysseus or Ulysses. He gets trapped by a one-eyed monster called the Cyclops. He tricks the Cyclops and he blinds him. And so the Cyclops can't see him. He got the Cyclops drunk and he got a sharp stick and he drove that stick into his eye. But he was still trapped in the Cyclops' cave. And the Cyclops was trying to find him, trying to beat with his hands to find out where, where Odysseus was. The word that Homer uses in that poem in the Odyssey of groping, trying to find Odysseus, is the word that Paul uses to the Athenians. He says, like, like the Cyclops trying to find Odysseus, you need to look for God, but the problem is that you're blind. But, you know, he's not far. He's not far away from, from each of you. Now, he at this point, he quotes two of the Greek poets who evidently both said that we are God's offspring. Acts 17, 28. In Him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we are His offspring. Well, let me just say at this point that... Um, we have the possibility of a controversy here. 
because Christians believe that God is not the father of everyone. Only Christians have the right to call God their father. You know, no one in the Old Testament ever addressed God as father. Two or three times God is called the father of Israel, but no one ever directly addressed God as father in the Old Testament. Jesus always called God Father, except for one time, and that was on the cross. When Jesus was quoting Psalm 22 while he was dying on the cross, remember Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani? Eloi was the shortened version of Elohim, this word that I wrote on the board behind us. Jesus uses that word, my God, my God, instead of my Father, my Father when he's quoting Psalm 22 on the cross. But every other time, Jesus called God Father. When you and I become Christians, we are adopted into God's family. John 1.12 says that by faith, we receive the right to be called the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. That's John 1.12 and 13. So before we trusted Christ, before we exercised faith in the claims of Jesus, we did not have the right to be called God, to call God Father, and so really we were not God's children. But what about what Paul says here? Well, I don't know how you make the distinction in Russian, obviously, but in our English translation, it doesn't say we're all the children of God. We're all brothers and sisters because we're children of God. We are God's offspring. God did make us. We are His creation, but we're not His children. Not until we trust Christ. In other words, we're not children who are heirs. We're not recognized children. We're not children who have a right to the inheritance. We are created by God, yes, but we're only adopted by God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in verse 29, we should not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. In other words, there's nothing that man can make in an idol which can be like God. Here's what Paul is saying. When you make an idol, you are left with the impression that you have made God because you make the image that you worship. I'm preaching to you just the opposite. You need to understand that you can't make God. God made you. The proper emphasis is worshiping God as the Creator. The wrong emphasis is you're creating an idol and you're worshiping your own creation. You need to worship God as a, cre as a creature of God. You don't need to worship God as being the Creator of God. This is the point he's making. He's saying, you've got it upside down. You're looking at it completely the wrong way. Now, can you imagine coming to, into a place like that and saying, all of you, with all this beautiful culture, with all this ancient tradition, it's all based on a lie. It's all based on a misunderstanding. It's all based on your own foolishness and your mistakes. You're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn around. That's what Paul was saying. And Paul says in verse 30, God has overlooked all this ignorance of yours, but now, and this also is a great evangelistic verse. Remember I said that Acts 16, 31 was a great evangelistic verse? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Acts 17, 30 is also a great evangelistic verse. God has declared that all men everywhere should repent. And so that's what he's telling the Athenians. I'm sure that when he stood up, they thought, we can educate this boy. We can train him. We can, cha we can change him. We can teach him to be smart like us. We can teach him to, ch to be like us, to think like us. And Paul says, you need to change your thinking. You're wrong. You need to repent. 
you need to go in a different direction. You know why? Because God's going to judge every one of us. He has fixed a day when He will judge the world in righteousness. In Greek thought, history was cyclical. History was on a cycle. In other words, history revolved like the seasons. You have winter, you have spring, you have summer, you have the fall, and then you start over. You have winter again, and then you have spring again, then you have summer again, then you have the fall again, and you start over again. And it turns and turns, it revolves, and it's the same thing over and over and over and over. And the Greeks thought of history that way. They think of history like the seasons. History is just like a cycle. It's just the same thing over and over and over. In biblical thought, history is not circular. It's not cyclical. It does not revolve. History is linear. It has a beginning in creation, and it has an end in judgment. And that's what Paul is saying. One classical scholar who taught at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, a professor of classics, E.M. Blakelock, his comment on Athens was, at the time that Paul visited Athens, Athens was in the late afternoon of her glory. In other words, her greatest glory was behind her in the age of Pericles, in the age of Socrates, in the age of Plato. She's now in the late afternoon of her glory. Her power has waned. It's gone, it's gone down. She's not as important as she used to be. Paul is saying that God will one day bring an end to everything. He will bring an end to history, and then we come under judgment. And Paul is warning them about that judgment, and he's asking them to repent. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. Paul has just informed the Athenians that history is indeed linear because history will come to an end. And it will come to an end in judgment, God's judge, righteous judgment upon every human creature. Well, what will be the standard of judgment? Well, the standard of judgment will be the degree to which every man and woman has lived up to righteousness. Well, what is the standard of righteousness? How do we know what righteousness is? What is our, um, what is our base of orientation? How do we know what's up and what's down, what's right and what's wrong. Well, the way we know is through a man. God sent a righteous man to fulfill righteousness, to establish a final standard of righteousness which even law could not establish, and to give us the power to grow toward God's righteousness. Well, how do we know that this man is God's representative and God's standard. We know because this man, alone among all men, was raised from the dead. Well, wait a minute. Wasn't Lazarus raised from the dead? Wasn't Dorcas raised from the dead in chapter 9? Well, they were all resuscitated only to die again later. This man was raised to life forever, never to die again. This man is God's appointed standard of righteousness. This man is the way that God will judge the world. Now, verse 32 says that when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they begin to sneer and to mock. But others said, let's talk about this some more. But some believed and Luke names two believers, a man and a woman, who came to faith that day. One was named Dionysius, and the other was named Damaris. 
Okay, that ends Acts 17, but we need to talk about it in a minute. You must understand that among Christian teachers and students, there's a bit of a controversy. And the controversy is this. Some people say that the apologetics of Paul in Acts 17 are flawed. That he did the wrong thing. That he, he had the wrong emphasis. That instead of just preaching the gospel, he fell into a philosophical analysis and a philosophical discussion. They say that there wasn't a church planted in Athens. And the reason there wasn't a church planted in Athens was because Paul had a poor missionary approach which did not leave a church. They strengthen this argument by pointing out some things that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Um, because the next place that Paul goes in chapter 18 is Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about the way he preached in Corinth. And he talks about the fact that, that when he preached, um, he didn't preach the world's idea of wisdom. He talks about this in um, beginning in 1 Corinthians 1.20. He talks about the debater and the scribes, the wise men, really the philosophers. And he says, you know, God didn't establish the gospel through the wisdom of men. He says, the Greeks are searching for wisdom, the Jews are looking for signs, but we preach Christ. So he says, you know, when I came to you, I preached Christ. Now, the suggestion is this. In, in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I determined to know nothing among you except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified which is God's wisdom. And so there's the suggestion that Paul is regretting that he's comparing the way he preached in Corinth to the way he, he preached in Athens. That maybe I did preach man's wisdom in Athens, but I realized that that really won't work. So by the time I got to Corinth, I, I got it right. This is the argument. Let me say that even though some tremendous scholars have made this argument, beginning with Sir William Ramsey, one of the first great Pauline scholars at the end of the 19th century. Um, I don't think it's a good argument. We also talked about the argument that Paul did the wrong thing in dismissing John Mark from the team after the first missionary journey, before the second missionary journey at the end of Acts 15. And I tell you that I don't think Paul did the wrong thing by doing that. So there, there's a school of New Testament interpretation which is fond of saying Paul did the wrong thing here and he did the wrong thing there. Uh, in chapter 18, he shaves his head because he kept a vow. And there are some who say, well, he did the wrong thing there. He has Timothy circumcised later and they say, well, he did the wrong thing there. So there's a certain way of approaching the career of Paul where we second guess him and we criticize him and we say, well, he shouldn't have done that. He should have done it a different way. Let me just say that I'm not convinced. I don't think it was a part of Luke's purpose to show the mistakes that Paul made. We know that Paul did make mistakes. He was a man. He was a human creature. Only Christ did not make mistakes. But I don't think the purpose of Luke's writing was to highlight or emphasize the mistakes of Paul. As far as this business of there not being a church in Athens uh, established as a result of that sermon, or um, as, as far as the whole question of uh, the response to the sermon and whether it worked or not, uh, we are told that there were three different responses. Some people criticized him. Some people laughed at him. Some people said, let's talk some more about it. We'll discuss this subject again. And some people believed. What's wrong with that? I mean, isn't this the normal experience that we have when we preach the gospel? Sometimes we preach the gospel and nobody believes. 
There were converts made as a result of that sermon. It was an appropriate sermon because Paul had to address the categories that they had misunderstood. He had to show them how their philosophy was wrong. It was a bold sermon. It was a courageous sermon. He told them about the resurrection, something that was foolishness to their philosophy. He told them that they were going to be judged through the righteousness of Christ. That's the gospel. That there would be a judgment and that their eternal destiny would be determined on the way they responded to Jesus. No, I think when Paul talks about the different ways that he could have preached the gospel in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, he's not contrasting his preaching style with the way he had preached in Athens. He's contrasting his preaching style with the way the Corinthians wanted him to preach. They wanted him to preach in such a way that would um, satisfy their ideals of Greek rhetoric. They had rules for public speaking. They were taught these rules in school. And Paul did not speak in such a way to keep their rules. He says, no, I didn't do that. That's the wisdom of men. I base my preaching on the wisdom of God. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.